you thought you got to sit down. Let's stand up for the gospel, would you please? <laughs> A gospel for Reformation Sunday from the 8th chapter of John. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The gospel of our Lord. Thank you. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, the day we've been waiting for is here. We're actually not celebrating the Reformation today. I don't think celebrating is the right word. We are observing the Reformation. We can be very proud of our ancestors in faith who began that long process of reforming, updating, changing the church, making the church more up-to-date and more relevant for people. But we also know it was a painful experience. Thousands of people died in the process. And so we don't celebrate that. We celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate the birth of our Lord. The Reformation, we observe. What we do celebrate, though, is that for hundreds of years now, Lutherans and Catholics and other Protestants have been working together to come closer together. The Roman Catholic Church has a wonderful pope right now. If Francis had been pope 500 years ago, there would have been no Reformation it would have already been reformed, the church. We have a great deal accomplished in the last several hundred years, and we continue to accomplish this coming together, this healing. 500 years before the Reformation, the Christian church split east and west, Eastern Orthodox from the Western or Latin or Roman church. And then with Luther, that Latin church split again. We've been coming closer together every year, We are closer together. Please don't tell any Catholic bishop this, but I have actually officiated at Mass at a Catholic church. (laughs) You're not allowed to do that, but we're coming closer all the time. One of the things that I remember with fondness was 1997 at the biennial assembly of the ELCA in Philadelphia. I was privileged to be there and watch as we signed what they called a concordat, which is an agreement with the Roman Catholics in which the Roman Catholics said, people are saved by God's grace through faith. The very thing that Luther taught. So we celebrate, because we also, as Lutheran said, yeah, and we show that faith by our good works. So Catholics won also that day. We celebrate that we have people like Martin Luther who can teach us. People like Luther who are always with us, always present to tell us we can reform, we can change, we can be the church of Jesus Christ today if we are faithful, if we are focused on the word of God, we can reform today. Luther is always with us in spirit, Excuse in me, mind. sir. Excuse me. Dr. Luther, if you're going to speak about me today, I wonder if you would be gracious enough to allow me to say a few words on my own behalf? Yes, the the pulpit is yours. Well, thank you, sir. Yes. And good morning. Good morning. I appreciate you having me and allowing me to hopefully give you a few words of encouragement. Let me begin by asking you a somewhat rhetorical question. May I? We think we are something, don't we? We Europeans in this year of our Lord, 1517, think that we are masters of the world. We think that God is impressed with us. We think that we are all that, don't we? Do you know it was uh, 25 years ago this month that the Italian Christopher Columbus discovered that new continent of America? 
And now we Europeans have a whole new land to conquer, gold to find, Indians to enslave, and settlements to begin. Can't we see the pride and ambition in us? Do you know, recently, scientists have begun using this new invention, the eyeglass, to make small things look large. And it works. They call it a flea glass because they like to look at fleas with it. And I'm told that if you put two or more of these somehow together, you can actually study the heavens where scientists hope to find more than the five planets revolving around our Earth. But, I say, what they really hope to find is ourselves big as the center of our universe. To the east, the emperor's armies have stopped the invading Turks at the walls of Vienna, and our Holy Roman Empire is safe once again, and we feel content, don't we? Too content. Do you know down in Rome, the Pope is building what he says will be the largest church in the world. One building covering more area than most of our poor German villages. The pride and the ambition in us. Ten years ago, uh, 200 miles from here or so, in Nuremberg, a man named Peter Henlein invented this little device. Do you know what it is? It's a timepiece that fits in one's pocket. And now we can watch to see how quickly time passes. And we think to ourselves, can I accomplish all that I want to accomplish in just this one day? And then, of course, there is that invention from Johannes Gutenberg. No doubt you've heard of this. It's called a printing press. And he uses it mostly to print indulgences which are the get-out-of-hell free passes that then some people try to sell. Can you imagine that? Trying to buy your way into heaven. If Gutenberg wants to print something useful, let him print the Bible. Or print this. My 95 demands for improving the church. We are so full of ourselves. I've even heard, I've even heard that in Spain... A sailor named Magellan is about to attempt to sail around the entire world. Can that even be done? I, I don't know. But it seems that the pride and ambition of people today is boundless. <laughs> and our successes are even spoiling us with our creature comforts. Perhaps you heard that earlier this year, trailer, traders have introduced our princes to a new spice from the Orient, and they drink it in hot water, of all things. Coffee, they call it. And now every common man seems to want to try this coffee. When we commoners assume the drinks of princes, where will we end in our presumption? With coffee in church? God forbid. <laughs> but tell me, what do all of our accomplishments mean to God? Oh, he no doubt looks at us like a father watching his young children begin to walk and then to run. But God does not love us or accept us because we are doing great and impressive deeds. My friends, what matters most to God is simply our love and our faith. He accepts us and loves us not because of our successes, but because in our weaknesses we rely on Him and we trust in Him. The works that God calls us to practice are patience, gentleness, love toward one another and toward our enemies, chastity, kindness, and all the things that these virtues imply. But those kind of works do not rate or have any glamour in the eyes of the world, for they are not unusual. They're not pompous. 
That's why they enjoy no reputation in the eyes of the world. But their works, on the other hand, open wide the eyes and ears of people. They create this effect by impressive pageantry and great expenditures, a magnificent architecture. In their adornment, everything glitters and shines. They burn incense, they ring bells and sing songs and light candles and tapers until nothing else can be seen or heard. I say, forget your show and your accomplishments. The Apostle Paul says, a man is justified apart from the works of the law. We spontaneously do loving and good things not because the law demands it, but out of gratitude to God. It's utterly wrong to think that the works of the law could satisfy God. I say do not cling to the outward letter of the law, but ignore the inner spirit of the law. Let me give you a homely illustration, if I might. A cow. Must have hay, must have straw. That's a law for her, without which she cannot survive. But through that law, that cow does not become a daughter or an heiress in the house. She remains a simple cow, does she not? So I say here too. Although I obey all the laws and the commands of the emperor, I do not become God's dear child. And far less am I, or do I become God's dear child, through monkery, even if monks were a thousand times holier than they are. But, back to my illustration, if that cow said, I am a daughter, I am an heiress in the house, and then lay down in the cradle in which the daughter should lie, we would say the idea, out with such a daughter. Or better still, bring in the butcher and we'll teach that daughter some manners. So I say here, we cannot presume to enter God's house by acting pious and simply doing good deeds. Good works do not make a good man, but a good man will do good works. And conversely, likewise, evil works do not make a wicked man, but a wicked man will do evil works. Now, if you rely on God's grace to become good and righteous, that is to say, if we have faith in God, God will give us a wonderful gift. Do you know what it is? It is the gift of freedom. Fall on God's mercy and you no longer need worry about doing enough good works to please him. You're free. That's what Jesus said in your your gospel reading today. He said, if you continue in my word, you are truly what? My disciples. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you what? Free. So, let me ask you this. What does it mean to be free? Let me give you two truths about the freedom of a Christian. A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. And a Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians, Though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all. And in Philippians he says, Christ was born in the form of God and of a servant. So love, by its very nature, is ready to serve and be subject to the one whom it serves. So I say to you, my dear friends, we are free to live and think as we choose. But God knows 
that we will want to do loving things, good things, deeds of service in order to please Him. Our faith in Christ does not free us from works. It only frees us from the false opinions about those works. That is the presumption that somehow our works can earn God's love and our salvation. But, let me caution you. The devil is a master of a thousand works. And he lays traps for us with marvelous cleverness. Some people he leads astray through open sin. But others, and this may be more dangerous, others, he leads them astray by getting them involved in subtle sins. They think themselves righteous, but then he brings them to a stop and makes them lukewarm and robs them of their desire for righteousness. God's message is clear. Turn away from the vain pursuits of this ambitious age. Give up the self-glorification of the rich and famous. Instead, seek righteousness, hunger, thirst after it. For with it comes the gift of salvation. It is not earned. It is a gift from our gracious God and Father to whom be the glory now and forever. Amen. And I thank you. Good morning. Thank you, God. a 30-minute sermon last week. I'm sure they appreciate your brevity today. Thank you so much. Would you please rise for prayer? Open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. We give you thanks, Lord, that you continually reform and purify the church. Fill it with all truth and peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is an error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in need, provide for it. Where it is continually unifying and supporting, celebrated, and where it is still divided, reunited, for the sake of your Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for creation, for the power of the sun, wind, and water, for the riches buried in rock and soil, for the magnificence of the gift of life you've given us. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for nations, for leaders of government, for fair commerce between nations, for all who lead our economy to be healthy and generous. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for the poor and the outcast, for those who cannot afford food, medicine, clothing, and shelter for communities and agencies who serve the needy, and for those who advocate on their behalf. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for this congregation, for the unemployed and overworked, for all who are burdened by debt, for the sick, and those in particular need, especially those listed in our book of prayer. Lord, in your mercy, we give thanks for the saints of every time and place, and especially this day for Martin Luther. By your Spirit, grant us sure confidence in the everlasting glory that you promise. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share his peace, especially with those who don't know.